got a lot I want to try to get through. John chapter 6 is a longer chapter, but we'll, we should be able to get through the whole thing tonight. And we'll start reading in verse 1. It says, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into the mountain where he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, and the number was about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples of them which were set down, and likewise the fishes, as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. So right here, very famous story about the feeding of the 5,000. We all know this story, okay? You've heard this story a thousand times. And you know, when it comes to this story, most people miss the whole point of this story. This story right here, this is one of the safe stories. This is one story that everybody knows because every preacher will preach about it. This is a subject, you know, it's like there's such a small subject range in a lot of churches today, and especially among these, you know, just crazy liberal ones, okay? Back when I was on the radio, I would listen to some of the programs before, and it seemed like it was always, you know, the uh, woman taken in adultery. Everybody loves telling that story, you know, don't judge, uh, you know, that, that scripture. You know, it was always the easy, you know, God is love, John three sixteen. Everybody taught that stuff all the time. And John chapter 6 is this, this first part, this is a very common story. This is safe. You'll, you, you'll probably hear Joel Osteen preach this part of the chapter. But do you realize most people, because John chapter 6 is a long chapter, there's 71 verses, okay? We're going to try to get through 71 verses tonight. It's a long chapter, and most people, you know, most, when they are preachers, when they preach this, they stop there, okay? They stop at the feel good part, and so they end up missing the main point of this story, okay? And so this miracle of the feeding and the multitude, of course, this is an incredible miracle, okay? It defies science, it defies logic, it defies common sense. But, you know, this is the creator here that we're talking about. Multiplying loaves is no big deal to him. This is an amazing miracle. But, you know, this story, this isn't about feeding people. That's not the message we're supposed to get. And most people miss the point. See, notice, in the, we see in the first two verses... The multitude here, they're following Jesus, but they're following him for the wrong reasons. It says in verse 2, it says that great multitude followed him because of the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. Listen, I don't care who the person is. If they're healing people diseases, they're going to get a multitude following them, aren't they? And listen, Jesus would do those amazing things to get the masses following him. But it was so they would hear the real message. So they would listen. And so he could give them the real blessings, the real gifts that he came for. But this multitude here, they're all following Jesus for the wrong reason. Just like in a lot of these charismatic churches and these liberal churches where you'll hear them preach on this all the time, the people in these churches are there for the wrong reason. And people do, they like this, you know, oh, this is a great message you can preach about God's provision. You know, if God can multiply loaves, you know, he can multiply your bank account. You know, just send us money and, you know, he'll do it. You know, that's a very, very easy message. That you could do. It's very, you know, nothing controversial in here. But this multitude was following Jesus for the wrong reason. Like a lot of people who go to church today. I'm going to go to church. Hopefully this will make my life better. Hopefully my problems will go away. But listen, Jesus feeding them in the story. Part of the reason he fed them. You realize he was helping them keep the law. Look what it says in verse four. It says, and the Passover, 
a feast of the Jews was nigh. When Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company coming to him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? Okay, and this story here, we're seeing that he's not just feeding them so they won't be hungry, but it's Passover. One of the things they were supposed to eat on Passover is unleavened bread. That was part of you know, the custom that they had and part of that law that they had. And Jesus here, he's helping them keep the law. And you know what? Isn't that what Jesus does for us when he saves us? When we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that our faith is counted for righteousness. You say, but how can we, how can we be considered righteous when all we've done is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Because he fulfilled the law for us. He paid for our sins. He did all that. And so, you know, Jesus Christ, you know, the bread of life, we're going to see. He's the one that, you know, he's the one that satisfies us. He's the one that fills us. And because of what he did, we can be saved and we can, we can have righteousness. And he is the one that does it for us. Jesus, he helped all these people keep the law in a way that was impossible by multiplying the loaves for them. And Jesus Christ, he's helped, he's made us keep the law which is impossible because we've already broken the law. But because of that miracle that he did, because of his death and his burial and resurrection, we can be considered righteous in the eyes of God too. And so, so some great symbolism in there, I think. But Jesus Christ is who we go for if we're going to find righteousness. Matthew 5, 6 in the Beatitudes, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. That's how we find filling. That's how we find fulfillment in that. If you want to find righteousness, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, Jesus will feed you. He's the one that he's the one that can take care of that. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so these people, notice they believed in Jesus after this, but for the wrong things. Look what it says in verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. So we see here too that you know just believing in Jesus, it's, that doesn't save you. Okay, Catholics believe in Jesus, don't they? But they're not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, they're not trusting in His work for their salvation, are they? Yeah, they believe in Jesus, but they think they've got to be good to go to heaven. Okay, they're not. They don't believe the words of Jesus. These people believed he's a great prophet. I mean, look at, look at what he just did with those loaves and the fish. There's obviously something special about this guy, but we're going to see that these people did not trust the spiritual message that Jesus did. Any of us in here, if we saw somebody do the miracles Jesus did, we would believe, a lot, we would believe in them, I guess you could say, in, in, in one way or the other, but it was the spiritual things. Those are the things once again, and we've talked about before, where faith is required. Okay, Because when a person gets saved, we don't see anything physical, do we? Nothing physical happens. When Jesus is multiplying loaves, you're seeing a physical miracle manifest itself. Okay, Those people, just believing in that, that's not showing faith. But when they see later when Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life, believing that, okay, that shows faith right there. So huge difference, once again, in believing in Jesus, believing on Jesus. And so look at verse 16. So that kind of ends that story or that part of the story. That's the part that you'll hear in most churches, but that's not the end of the story. Okay. Verse 16 says, and when even was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea and entered into his ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. And so when they had rowed about five and 20 or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But he said unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. Okay, Another incredible miracle that has just happened here. Jesus Christ has walked on the water. Also impossible. Jesus Christ literally teleports them in the boat to shore. I don't know how else to put it. Okay, I know that's kind of a sci-fi term, but that's what happened. They were in one place, and then now they're all of a sudden immediately in another place. An, an incredible miracle has just happened here. 
Okay, and it kind of throws the story in because it plays in to the, this next part. So now look at verse 22. It says, so the day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save the one wherein his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread, after that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. So notice how the people noticed that something happened. They saw Jesus go off by himself into the mountain. They saw his disciples get in a boat and head over. They knew what boats were there. They knew all that. And, you know, the Sea of Galilee, it's, you know, when you think about a sea, you know, a lot of times we think about a huge body of water, but it's actually, you know, we would call it more of a lake. There's another part of the Bible that calls it the Lake Gennesaret. You know, you can see across the Sea of Galilee. I've been there before. You know, I, I've been in these places. I've been to the place where you fed the 5,000. And you can, you can see across it, but it's still, it's a pretty, you know, long ways over there, especially when you don't have a motorboat. Okay, and uh, we can get across pretty fast today, but you're not going to walk to the other side in a day. If, you're, if you were to walk around it, it would take a really long time and so the people, they noticed that Jesus did not go with the disciples, but obviously some of them, they took a boat, whatever, they got over there. And Jesus is over there and they noticed, how did you get over here? You know, we saw you didn't get on with your disciples. There's no other boat. Okay, so these people, they noticed that a miracle happened, but Jesus didn't tell them what happened. Jesus didn't say, well, I walked across the sea. I only walked part way. I got in the boat and then we teleported. Or this, you know, he he, did, he doesn't tell them that, even though that's what happened. There's a, there's a reason for that. But notice though, in this story, the reason the people are looking for him, you know, they were looking. We're going to see that they were looking for him because it was the next day. They're hungry again. They want more food. Okay, and verse twenty five says, when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, whence camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. I mean, a bunch of greedy animals here, you know, just thinking about their stomachs. They, you would think the next day they'd have still been talking about that miracle. But no, they're hungry. You're going to give us more food? Are you going to give us what we want? Like my kids, we feed them every day. And then the next day they want to eat again. Sometimes before the day's even over, they want to eat again. It gets kind of old and it gets really expensive. But yeah, I, I guess I kind of understand the same way. But the, uh, verse 20, uh, yeah, so you see me not because you, of the miracles, but because you it, did eat the loaves and were filled. And so Jesus, you know, they didn't care about the miracles. They, didn't, they weren't even that interested in the fact that Jesus was on the other side of the sea. That should have caused more questions. They asked questions, but they got distracted real quick because they were thinking about their food. And, and I tell you, this attitude too, it drives me nuts. All the phone calls that we get here, just people wanting money. You know, people wanting us to pay their bills and, and buy their food. And it's like, what do you think we are? You know, we don't have that much money around here. We don't have, we don't have hardly any money. And these people, they, they just think we're made out of money. And I don't know, maybe it's from hearing these charismatic preachers talk about, you know, and that the multiplying of loaves and all the miracles. And a lot of those churches do have a lot of money, but we are not one of those churches. All right. We are not that way, but yet people do. And here's the problem. You can give them some, but they're going to be coming back the next day. wanting more. Yes. They were washing cars and giving money. What in the world? I guess. Good night. I wish I'd have went there and let them wash my car and give me money. Huh? Yeah. We're not going to do that. All right. Yeah. I, I heard that there was one of these guys that were going to start one of these trendy churches. They did start it. It didn't last real long. But one of the things they did, they went around to all the garage sales and they gave everybody $5. And I'm like, what in the world? What message is that supposed to send? You know, we're loving, we're giving, we're caring. You know, what did Peter say? Silver and gold have I none. All right, you know, and I can say that and not be lying. <laughs> I mean, it just, 
I, I, I don't understand that stuff. You know, I guess it works, but it does. It's going to get you a crowd like this crowd, and we're going to see what happens with this crowd too. So they're just going to be hungry. They're just going to be hungry the next day. You know, how come when we've had garage sales, we haven't had any of those churches come by and give us five dollars? I need to find out where these people are at and be. In, you, know, you just got to be in the right place at the right time. But yeah, they weren't. They and so look at verse twenty-seven. So Jesus is like, you know what? Yeah, you're looking for me because you're hungry again. In verse 27, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God that ye believe on him. Whom he hath sent. All right, now I, I've got a lot I want to try to cover about this passage right here. But notice, they wanted the ability when they are saying, you know, how can we do these things? How can we do the works of God? The re, what they were wanting, they weren't wanting to do spiritual things. They wanted the ability to do miracles. Hey, teach us that trick on how you multiply the loaves. That would help us out. You know, I, we could set up a bread company and, you know, make a, make a lot of money. You know, we could have a restaurant and have the cheapest prices and have the biggest profits if we can just multiply food. That's what they're thinking about. They're wanting, they're wanting to be able to do that miracle so they could just, you know, fill their bellies. That's what they were interested in. And so they, they weren't interested in the spiritual. We're going to see that they didn't, they didn't care about the spiritual. These churches that are doing all these things, you know, just doing the giveaways and all that stuff. The people that they're going to get don't give a rip about spiritual things. They're like, well, we got to do the physical so we can get the spiritual message across. Listen, when you entice somebody in with fleshly things, all you are doing is making them think about the flesh. It's not, it's not, you, you don't, you know, you don't get a spiritual message across by focusing on the flesh. Those things are contrary one to another. You're going to do the exact, have the opposite effect. Using fleshly things, bringing in worldly music, you know, worldly entertainment, bringing in the magicians, Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, all these things are going to have the opposite effect. That they're not going, you're not going to get people saved with that stuff. That's that is not how it works. And so, you know, people try to use verse 29, okay, because they want to do the works of God. And look what Jesus answered and said unto them: This is the work of God that ye believe on Him. Whom he has sent. Now, people, this is a classic verse here that people will try to use to prove that believing is a work. Okay? Because what do we teach here? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. We really hit the whole it's not of works thing really hard. Okay? And then you have people that say, you know, we believe. People have accused me of believing that in a work salvation. Because we believe that you have to believe, and they'll say believing is a work. And I'll take them to Romans 4. I think it's Romans 4. It says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth. And then what usually happens, they'll take me to John chapter 6 and verse 29. Okay? And look what it says. You know, these are the works. This is the work of God that you believe on him. Right there, that proves it's a work. Therefore, we all need to go Calvinist because... That's the only thing that teaches it's not of works. They just believe you don't have to do anything. God just saves you. you know. And if you teach that you have to believe, you're teaching work salvation, and John 6.29 proves that. What are you all going to do with that? Come on, what are you all going to do with it? I don't have a clue. No, I'm just going to, I know, I know exactly what I'm going to do with it. I was hoping you knew. No. But listen, salvation, it does require works. But not our works. Okay? It's the work of Christ. Okay, it was the work of God. Those are the works that get us saved. And you know, more specifically, the works of God. It's the work that Jesus did on the cross. Okay, who was it that provided the bread for them when they're in the wilderness? It was Jesus that did that. Who? What? Did, you know, they just had to sit down. They had to do what he said. They just had to receive it, didn't they? And what is it that we have to do? What works do we have to do in order to be saved? None. We just believe and he does the work for us. That's, and Jesus did that when he died on the cross. And so another way too you could look at this to show that this isn't teaching this, that believing is a work, you know, a way to maybe rephrase what Jesus said is when they, when they asked him what works they needed to do, 
he's basically saying, do nothing. Okay? So, I get, and a way to illustrate this, you know, because you see, the question they asked, it was kind of an unfair question. It's like the classic question, when did you stop beating your wife? Well, you can't really win when you answer that one, can you? If you say, well, I did, I stopped. You know, or have you stopped beating your wife? Well, yeah. If you say I stopped, it means you were at one time beating your wife. If you say I haven't stopped, well, it means you are still beating your wife, right? You know, so, you know, it's kind of one of those unfair questions that get asked sometimes. But listen, uh, you know, have you ever been working on a project, men, and your wife was questioning everything you were doing on that project? Kids, what am I thinking of right now? What am I thinking of right now? The latest... The bathroom, yeah, y'all know the bathroom, all right? I mean, I'm, I'm doing the bathroom, and she, I mean, constantly when I'm working on that, she would come in, and she would see something that didn't look right, and, uh, you know, what, what's, why does it look like? And I would always say, I have a plan. And I always did have a plan. It wasn't always a good one, but I always had a plan. I saw it, and when we were, we were hanging up, we were hanging, I think it was when I was hanging the crown molding, there was some stuff that didn't look right, and I was just like, and, and I did, I had a plan that was going to work and that did work. But I remember I was just like, your mom is going to come in here and she's going to ask me about this. And, you know, and I, I was like telling her, you, you are not allowed to come into the bathroom because I didn't want to hear her ask about it. All right. And so, and, and you know, one of the things, and so men, when you're doing one of those projects and your wife is constantly questioning you, why, you know, why does that frustrate you? It's because she doubts you can get the job done, doesn't it? And you know, and what is it that usually happens? Okay, she's questioning you. She doesn't think you can get the job done. For some reason, my wife didn't think I could be a good electrician and a plumber and a carpenter. I don't know why she thought that. All right, but at the same time, when you're getting questioned like that, it gets kind of it gets kind of frustrating. It shows they don't trust you. It shows they don't believe. And so, what usually happens in that conversation? You know, they come in. They're trying to help, and it's like, you know how you can help me? Don't. Do nothing, all right? And that's basically what Jesus is telling them. These people, they wouldn't believe Him. They would not trust Him. You know, what do we have to do to do the work? You know, here's the works of God. Believe. He's not saying that because belief is a work. I think it's the same thing. as You know how you could help me? Do nothing. Don't help me. Just trust me. Let me do this project. Let me get back to work. Let me do what I've got planned to do, and you'll see it'll be great. And... In the case of our bathroom, it wasn't quite what I promised. But let me tell you something. With what Jesus promises us, it will be exactly what He promised. We can trust Him. We can count on Him. And you know what? He doesn't need your help. Okay, He doesn't need your good works to help you get saved. You know what you can do to help your get set yourself get saved? You know what works you can do? Do nothing. Just believe. Just trust Him. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he says that here, listen, believing is not a work. Okay? And I do not believe for one second that that verse proves that it is a work, especially when there's all these other verses that says it's not a work. So, you know, that, that is, that's, a, that's a real bad argument. And so what we just need to do, we need to leave him alone and just trust him. So look what it says in verse 30. Then said they therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? And what doest and, and what dost thou work? Our fathers did eat man in the desert, it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. These people are still thinking about their stomachs. Once again, too, the Jews require a sign, don't they? The Jews require a sign. That always gets them in trouble. Alright? And it once again, they're like, all right, you know, if we're gonna believe you, you need to show us a sign. Alright, if you're not gonna give us any bread, at least put on a show for us. Show us a sign. And oh, by the way, when you're do, putting on the show for us and you're doing a sign, uh, how about do the manna, all right? Because we're still hungry, all right? You know, that bread already wore off from yesterday. How about some manna? I'm telling you, man, that is, that is, the, that is people today when they come to church. What do you got for me? What are you going to give me? Listen, we did, when we had our grand opening, we did some giveaways. And we, did, we had these people they were, they were, that showed up those first weeks when we're doing the giveaways. And it was like when the giveaway stopped, they stopped. It's like, you know, this is stupid. I said, I'm, I'm fine for doing that stuff. You know, we get we give things away sometimes, but I try to keep it random and I don't even like to advertise it. Because you know what? It's just kind of frustrating. We get all the freeloaders that just come in just to get their stuff. And you know what? I don't want to send that message that we're just about giving out stuff, 
that church is just a place where you come and get stuff. Well, that's, and that's not what it's about. And all that stuff that we give away, it goes, it, it disappears fast. Whether it be food. Listen, I like that we do the donuts and all that, but sometimes I think some people come so they eat the donuts. Well, you know what? Maybe we just bring nothing one week. This week we can watch your face and you can learn what church is really all about. It's not, it's not about the things you stuff in your face. Those things are a blessing. All right? I'm thankful when the ladies do that stuff. But if you're coming to church for the snacks, you're here for the wrong reason and you're missing the real message. And that, that was the problem that they had. And they did. They wanted the sign so they could believe. And notice Jesus didn't give it to them. Jesus, Jesus could have started raining down manna from heaven if he wanted to do that. That would not have been a problem for him. He did it before for 40 years in the wilderness. He could have done it again right then. But you know what? Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You don't go around putting demands on Jesus. You don't go around, you know, just, you know, you know, making him show you some sign, doing these things that people do where they say these prayers, you know, Lord, if you want me to go to church, do this. You know, Lord, if you want me to give something in the offering, you know, send me an extra check in the mail. You know, th- no, you don't do that stuff. You know, you don't tempt God with that stuff. Don't, you know, make deals like that with him. If he tells you to do something, you ought to do it no matter what. And if he wants us to believe him, we ought to believe him just because he said to. And these people, they didn't, they didn't want to do that. And so look what it says in verse 32. It says, then said, then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all of which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among, um, among yourselves. So notice in this passage, you know, Jesus, he's explaining the importance of the spiritual over the physical. He said, you know, they're, they're wanting that bread. You know, and they, you know, they like, give us that bread. They, you know, uh, in verse 34, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. And they're thinking physical again. I want bread. Kind of like the woman at the well. She wanted that water that she could drink where she would never thirst again because she didn't want to have to draw water anymore. These people, they want this bread where they'll never hunger again so they won't have to worry about feeding themselves anymore. So they'll be provided for and taken care of. Listen, back in those, this, it wasn't like America back then. Okay, In America, we want to eat whether we're hungry or not. Okay? You know, it's not a matter of, you know, eating for survival. You know, we don't eat to live, we live to eat. Okay, back then, they ate to live. It was a, it was a survival thing. And so if you could eat bread where you'll never get hungry again, well, you know, that would be great. And that's what they were interested in. And when they start getting the message that, you know what, he doesn't have any bread for us, they got out. They got upset. They wanted the physical bread and we see here in this story that, you know, Jesus, he's telling them on the bread, I came up from heaven. And they're like, he didn't come from heaven. We know where he comes from. We know how he was born. We know his family. We know his mother and father. Some of them might have known him when he was just a child. They would not believe his words. These people would not have faith. Even after the miracle of the, of the 5,000 feeding the 5,000, even after that miracle, they still didn't believe him. And so um, in verse 44, it says, no man can come to me except the father, which hath sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore that he hath heard 
and hath learned of the Father, cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And so right here, we see no one can be saved unless they are drawn by God. And this is another verse that the Calvinists like to use. You know, you, know, you can't come unless the Father draws you. Well, I agree. Okay? You're not going to get saved unless you're drawn by God. But look what it, let's jump up a few chapters in chapter 12. Okay? Nobody's going to come unless they're drawn. I agree 100%. But John 12, 32 says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now, was Jesus lifted up from the earth? Talking about his crucifixion? Absolutely. And he said, if that happens, I will draw all men unto me. So yes, you can't come except the Father draw you. But guess what? God draws everybody. God is going to draw everyone. Not everyone's going to accept. Some love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They're not going to come to the light lest their deeds should be made manifest. They, they don't, and so, um, and that's why it says too, you know, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Those who are looking for righteousness, I believe they'll find it. They'll be drawn by God. They'll be drawn by that light. They will go to the light and they will get saved. But those who do not get saved, they're not hungering and thirsting after righteousness. They're, they're going after sin. They're going after the things of the flesh. It's because they want to. We do have a will in this thing. We do have a say in this thing. And so, uh, you know, Jesus, you know, it's true. Nobody can be saved unless they're drawn by God, but God will draw all men. We see that later in John chapter 12. So when we eat the bread of life, or the way we eat the bread of life, it's when we believe on Christ for salvation. Look what it says in verse 40, uh, verse 48. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. I love that verse. Because once again, these people that just want the physical stuff, it doesn't last. You know, it, it would have been pretty, it was a miraculous thing when they ate that man in the wilderness, but they are all dead now. They all died. And a lot of them didn't even go to heaven. It says, this is, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Talking about his crucifixion. He gave his body. It was, it was beaten badly. And in verse uh, 52, the Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us flesh to eat? Thinking about their stomachs. You know, this, this just, it frustrates me reading this. It just, it reminds me of people around in this, in this town. Verse 53, then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him, as the living Father has sent me. And I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So we do that. We believe, we eat that bread when we believe on Christ for salvation. And they are, they're thinking, you know, where's the flesh? We want flesh to eat. And you know, we had some people that they came to church here for a few times. I invite them. I, I mentioned the fact we're having fellowship and, and they came and, they ended up coming. I think they they just they dropped in one other time, and I remember that it was it was kind of funny because they always would try to come whenever we were having the meals. And I remember I heard them. They were going to grab a bulletin, and I heard the one say, "Oh, look and see if they have any fellowships coming up." And I was just like, you know, you don't come just for the food, but you know what? That's all they care about. That was all they came for. That was all they cared about. And you know what? We actually did have something coming up I hadn't put in the bulletin yet. And you know what? I didn't tell them about it. Now, listen, we do try to use that. You know, if you want to try to use that to get your friends and neighbors, that's fine. But listen, do you understand that if they, you know, if they come just for that, and they, we might have the best meal ever. 
And they might think our church has the greatest cooks ever. But do you realize we didn't really do them any spiritual good with that meal? With all that food we shoved down their throat, we didn't really do anything that great. Listen, I'm all for feeding people. But do you understand? You know how many churches we have in this area that do meals all the time? I mean, I mean, in this area, you can pretty much get three meals a day, every day of the week, if you, you know, go from church to church. There's a lot of churches that do meals in this area, and most of these churches are your Protestant churches. They're as dead as a doornail, but they got a lot of guilty rich people in their church that donate a lot of money to do these things to help them feel good about themselves so they can feel like they're on their way to heaven. And they do. You get you got the low lives in this area that just they make their rounds. And they go and they get all the meals in these places and they never preach in the gospel in these places. They they don't they don't preach to these people. These people they show up, they stuff their faces and they leave. That's nice. If you want to do that for people, that is nice. You are welcome to do that, but you have not done them any good spiritually. And so, and you know, and that's what churches are all going to, because you know, we're supposed to be, we're supposed to be active, we're supposed to be busy, we're supposed to be involved in the community. No, you're supposed to be preaching the gospel to people. That's what you're supposed to be doing. And listen, we've got plenty of churches around this area doing the food. We don't need another one. And we can't afford to feed all these people in town anyway. And so I'm not going to worry about that. You know, we're going to, there's going to be one place. As long as I'm around here, there's going to be one place in this area that's preaching the gospel, that's preaching the truth, that's telling it like it is, that's preaching the whole counsel of God. Listen, I can't feed everybody. I can't provide for everyone's material needs, but I can sure preach the gospel. I can, I can let people know the truth and we can, I can soul win. It's cheap to go soul winning. It's free. You know, we just, just got to buy flyers and tracks and things and just get out there and walk and knock doors. It's the best way. It's the most effective way. We were talking about that Saturday with Brother Adam that, you know, you can, you can spend all, you know, churches will spend all kinds of money sending out mailers, you know, buying all these, you know, fancy door hangers and things so they don't have to talk to the people, you know, buying radio ads, newspaper ads, paying for commercials. But let me tell you, there's nothing more effective than just going and walking up to somebody face to face and talking to them and not just inviting them to church, but preaching the gospel to them. It is so effective. The guy, the guy we led to the Lord Saturday. You know, who knows how many commercials we'd have had to pay for, how many radio advertisements, how many mailers we'd have had to send out to get him to come to our church. It might not have ever worked. But you know what? When we got there and right in front of his face and presented the gospel to him, he understood it and he believed it and he called on the Lord for salvation and he got saved and it didn't cost us anything. Just the gas to drive over to that area. That's it. And they are, churches are getting away from that, just doing all this feel-good stuff that's completely worthless. Jesus wasn't impressed with that. People are missing the point of that story of the feeding of the multitude. It didn't do those people any good. They were back the next day wanting food. And let's look and let's see what happened to these people. I'm sure some of them got saved, right? Well, let, let's, go, let's go ahead and keep reading. Look at verse 59. Verse 59. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What? And if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. Y'all see that? Flesh profiteth nothing. What do people want? Well, I want healing. I believe, you know, they, they'll, they'll call for the preacher to come visit them at the hospital, hoping maybe this preacher can say a good enough prayer to heal them of their disease that they have. Why? Because they want their flesh taken care of. We knock on these people's doors. You know, how do you know you're saved? And they'll talk about some physical healing they had. They'll talk about some experience that they had. You know, somebody laid hands on them, they prayed, and God healed them, and so they know they're saved. Listen, that's, that's all about the flesh. The flesh profited nothing, the Bible says. Nothing. The flesh profited nothing. Underline that in your Bibles. Memorize that. That's not what it's about. And now I lost my spot. Uh, where was? Where were we? 63. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. 
And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back. Jesus had other disciples besides the twelve. We see that throughout the Gospels. After this amazing miracle that everybody talks about, that's like one of the famous subjects that every preacher can preach about and not have anybody get mad at him, people don't realize he lost a bunch of his disciples after that miracle. Why? Because they couldn't handle the spiritual message. Because it involved faith. They went back and walked no more with them. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Notice after this story, and I believe the real lesson that we need to learn from the feeding of the multitude is that, you know, that ultimately what was accomplished was they rejected the message. It, his, Jesus's following, it went from a multitude to 12. Y'all see that? From a multitude to 12. Many of his disciples, they walk. All right, forget this. It's just spiritual stuff. Listen, I just wanted all my needs met. I just wanted an easy life. Remember at the beginning of the chapter, after he fed them that way, they wanted to take him by force and make him king. Well, good night. You know, this, this king will definitely solve all our economic problems. He can multiply loaves. You know, the, you know, with the power he's got, you know, he'll be able to defeat our enemies. He'll be able to make everything great for us here on earth. But that was not why Jesus came. He came to pay for sins. He came to save souls. He came to do things of eternal value. Listen, there were many, many times. Go back and read the book of Judges. There were many times where God would send deliverers their way and they would have peace and they would have blessing for 40 years. But then what would always happen? They'd always go back to their old ways and get in trouble again. And Jesus could have come and you know, He could have you know, delivered them from their enemies and He could have made things great, but it was only a matter of time and they would have rejected Him. It's going to happen again after He reigns on earth for a thousand years. Eventually, they're, they're still going to reject again. Because the, So the real lesson we need to learn from this feeding of the multitude is that, you know what? It's not about the physical. It's about the spiritual. That's what Jesus came for. And I'm telling you, next time you hear, you're watching one of these you know, TV preachers talking about this story, you, know, you need to throw something through your TV screen because it, it's stupid. They're missing the point. Jesus didn't come for the physical things. He came to do the spiritual thing. And church today... It's become mostly about what can I get for myself? What does that church have to offer me? What kind of programs does it have for my kids? I got these rotten teenagers that are good for nothing and they don't have anything to do and they're always getting in trouble and they're always getting my hair. What kind of youth group do they have so they can have something to do? So they can have fun? You know, does that church have a Christian school so I can send my kid there because I don't, you know, I don't want to teach them at home. I don't want to have to, I, I'm, I'm too lazy to do that. You know, what do they have to offer me? You know, what, what kind of fun stuff? Do they have? Do they have daycare? A lot of churches have daycare centers. Daycares. I don't want to raise my little kids. You know, does church have that? And by the way, those daycares are pretty good money makers sometimes for churches. Maybe we ought to think about that. No, no. no that's, that's not a church ministry. That's a business. All right? that, that's exactly what that is. But it is, what can I get for myself? How much fun can the church provide? Many want Christ thinking this will make me happier on earth and will give me an easier life. And you know what? That might happen. If you start following Christ, there's going to be a lot of sin that you're going to get out of your life and it will definitely improve things in some areas. But you know what? Sometimes you have tribulation. That's no guarantee. It, it might make things worse, physically speaking. But we need to understand Jesus came to earth to take care of the spiritual things. And those are what is important to him. And if you get caught up in only the physical, you know what's eventually going to happen? You're going to get offended by something. You're going to move on. Well, you know what? 
the show's getting kind of old. The show's getting kind of boring here. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. And I hear that other church down the street's got a better show. They they do you know they do the fancy plays. They got the fancy lighting. They got the bands. They got the water slide baptismal. You know that they, they have Santa Claus at Christmas. They have the Easter Bunny. They have the devil on Halloween. You know they they have they have you know they they got the, they got the fun stuff. That church gives away better candy. You know what? Whatever, you know, these, these things are, these things are ridiculous. It's, it's not what it's all about. And we've got to, we've got to get out of that mindset. And we've got to stop reading the story in the beginning of John chapter six and thinking, you know, if we can just, you know, do good enough giveaways, that will draw the people in and then we'll get them with the gospel. Well, it didn't work for Jesus. What makes us think it's going to work for us? Why don't we just preach the gospel? Why don't we focus on that? If you want to do a giveaway, fine. We'll, we'll do some of those things for fun. But you know, a lot of our giveaways we do, let's just be honest. Okay? When we give away those coffee mugs, that's advertisement for the church, isn't it? You know, when we're giving away the pens and things, these are advertisement for the church. You know, are we changing people's lives with those? No. We're advertising our church. Okay? I, I, think, I think it's fine to, fine to do some of that. But listen, even if we feed people, let's not get a big head. Let's not think, wow, we're real good charitable people. Wow, we're a really great church. We gave away more stuff than any other church. Who cares if we're not preaching the gospel? Go to one of these churches. Go to the Nazarene church over in Sterling where they do meals all the time and see if they preach the gospel to you. You know what? I, I would get in trouble if I did this. I've thought about going to some of these places and just pretending, you know, I'm not a Christian and just say, hey, yeah, yeah. Go incognito and be like, "How do I get to heaven?" And just see what would happen. I would. I mean, that would be kind of. I mean, but I'm telling you, you know what? Maybe I should start doing that. You know, do like hidden cameras and stuff. I could put that. I'd become a YouTube sensation if I did something like that. But I would. I'd like to see what these bozos say, and just watch them buckle under the pressure, and just you know, and then expose them. You know, advertise it all over town. <laughs> this church is sending people to hell, and I have proof. Yeah, yeah, but but that is, they are they're so focused on these things, and it's not working. Jesus Christ, that bread of life. When you read John chapter six, read the whole chapter and get the spiritual message because that's what it's all about. So, with that, let's all stand together.